Hello and welcome to the Tekken Sports Podcast. Tekken Sports is a show about how technology is revolutionizing all of the major sports as well as health and fitness. You can find it on your podcast service of choice. My name is Alex Radu and I'm here with the one and only Mandy Kovacs. Hello. This week we have a discussion about whether or not the NHL should adopt goal line technology, plus all of the biggest news from the last week, new apps or wearables, and your weekly concussion update. But before we get to that, we would really appreciate it if you would review and rate the Tech and Sports Podcast on iTunes and Google Play or wherever else you get your podcasts from. It really does help us grow the show, and we really, really appreciate all the support so far. And with that, sit back and relax, because the Tech and Sports crew is entering the game. All right, Mandy, the news. All right, so first up is a quick story here. The 144th Kentucky Derby was this past Saturday, May 5th, and for the first time ever, cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin were used to place wagers and bets on the race. We've recorded this before the big event, so we don't exactly know who won, but apparently there's been a huge surge of cryptocurrency betting. Over $100 million was wagered on last year's Derby, which is a new record, and organizers expect this year to surpass that thanks to this new avenue of betting. It's weird because it's like it's like gambling with like stocks or something. Mm-hmm. Like <laughs> it's such like a weird thing to gamble with. It's like you're already kind of gambling with cryptocurrency. I was gonna say it's like this weird sort of inception. <laughs> yeah. Right. You're gambling with gambling. Yeah. Gambling <laughs> inception is what we'll call this. Yeah. All right. Cool. <laughs> and now moving on, the WNBA is renewing its streaming partnership with Twitter for the second straight year. The platform will live stream 20 games during the 2018 regular season, broadcasting one game every Tuesday starting on May 20th until the season finale on August 19th. This is not exclusive to the U.S. either, so fans around the world will be able to watch the games if they have NBA TV, WNBA League Pass, and the ESPN Plus app where Twitter plans on sharing its broadcast. This is exciting. WNBA is some great basketball. Absolutely. Uh, LA Sparks all the way. As Shout out say. Kia Nurse. Uh, the nurse absolutely. family is just a beast. <laughs> I mean, that's 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 just the truth. Um, and uh, I guess, you know, we'll see if the Minnesota Lynx win again. Yeah. Um, but, okay, yeah, the season starts soon. Everyone watch women's basketball because it's fantastic. It is really fantastic. All right, and next up, one more Twitter-related news as well. Apparently, Disney will be creating live sports and news programming specifically for the social media platform. Disney actually owns ESPN, so it plans on offering a Twitter version of its flagship Sports Center TV show with breaking news and analysis. Twitter will also live stream ESPN's Fantasy Focus Live podcast. So all of this was unveiled in an announcement of more than 30 new and extended partnerships from Twitter last week, and we've already covered the recent content deals it made with the MLB and MLS, so it really looks like Twitter is using 2018 to make its huge push to get it into the sports streaming market. Yeah, I mean, this is interesting because it's really just Twitter banking on so many types of platforms. Like sports, I think, only made up ultimately like five or six of the streaming platforms that of the 30 that they announced. Right. So it's really um, quite small. Yeah. So Twitter's really trying to do a lot, but it works because right, the way I look at sports streaming on Twitter, we're already on Twitter when we're watching games. Mm-hmm. Like I'm already looking at sports mm-hmm. on like for at on Twitter. That's one of the reasons why I use that platform. So it makes sense that if like there was like breaking analysis right after a game, uh, right on the platform, that would be easy to watch. Like in cut up clips of like just a couple minutes or something yeah, like that. For sure, I would watch it. Mm-hmm. So I think it, it'll be interesting to see what Twitter does. Like it, obviously, like watching an hour long show on Twitter is probably not going to happen. No, but, I like, doubt it. A, a few minute clip to five minutes of you know analysis with some of my favorite you know ESPN superstars and stuff like that. Yeah, then, cause- sure. Yeah, we're there for analysis anyways, right? In the 240 characters, or what is it, 280? Mm -hmm. (laughs) 280 characters, you know? So if you can have a couple minute clips, makes it that much easier. Yeah, the video version of 280 characters. Exactly. (laughs) We're on board. Okay, and now just in time for his return to the court, Under Armour has released a Steph Curry-focused trivia app called Steph IQ in conjunction with app developer Red Interactive. Users will be able to play the game within three minutes of Curry making his first three-pointer in each playoff game that he plays in. So once activated, the app will ask you eight multiple choice questions and players will get 10 seconds to answer each one. So if you get every question right, you have a chance to win one of 10 pairs of Curry Pie Day sneakers and $10,000 in Under Armour store credits. 
So like the popular trivia game HQ, if you get a question wrong, you are eliminated. The app does also give you one free pass for you to skip one question besides the final one, of course, and you get that by signing up for the game through a user referral. So the first chances to win prizes was Friday, May 4th, but as long as the Warriors do well, you'll have plenty more opportunities to win. So you can download this uh, from the Apple App Store or Google Play. I have to see if this is in Canada because uh, I do. Uh, I am quite curious about this. Uh, you know, Steph Curry focused trivia app. Uh, I wonder if it. So is it just like you know basketball trivia, or is it just like about him and uh, like Aisha and stuff? Like right. I, like is it about his life or yeah. like his just basketball? Life? Which is just fascinating. Also, well, my favorite aspect of this is you can tell that he's been injured. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> All of the curry related news that we've had mm-hmm. after he's been off the court. <laughs> right? And now that he's coming back, everyone's like, yeah, capitalize on him. Yeah. And we're seeing all of these things being released now. Well, hey, as a uh, uh, bandwagon Pelican fan, I mean, I definitely feel the hurt. So, Oh, my God. Okay. Anyways, uh, in health news today, apparently there's a new studio lab opening up in British Columbia that will use mixed realities like AR and VR to explore how emerging technology can help the healthcare sector. So three organizations, the Health and Technology District, Conquer Experience, and Stamble Studios are collaborating on this place called XR Lab. So there will be shared spaces and facilities, workshops and different programs, as well as business services that hope to encourage forward thinking ideas that use these technologies like virtual reality and augmented reality for healthcare solutions. So some of the innovations from this will be showcased at the BC Tech Summit, which is happening in Vancouver from May 14th to 16th. So if you're in the area, check it out. I mean, this is great. I mean, we always talk about how these technologies are. I think we're still all these all these companies are still trying to persuade users why they would use them. Right. And I think healthcare is just such a really good way to do that and prove why this technology is going to be useful Mm -hmm. um so and i think as we've seen in the past people tend to trust it more when it's in a healthcare situation rather than in another one Mm -hmm. so it uh, this is a, a really cool thing to see i feel like all of the emerging technologies that we've been talking about whether it's ai or virtual reality that sort of stuff they all have such good applications in the healthcare sector Like, this is really the foundational level that we're going to see a lot of this implemented, I think. Yeah, no, I agree. Like, I think it's just, it's again, like, trust comes to a big thing. People don't necessarily trust, like, banks or retail or Mm -hmm. uh, other types of companies, but most people trust their doctor, so. Well, not Trump's, but. (laughs) (laughs) That's fair. (laughs) All right, and our last story of the day is about some innovation going on at Rice University. So students at the school have designed a first-of-its-kind software called Cherry Pick that provides automated sports analytics in an hour using artificial intelligence and machine learning. So the software allows coaches to record a game, upload video, and receive statistics from the game within an hour, which is a significant improvement over other analytics programs, which usually have a turnaround time of 12 to 24 hours. It also lets coaches tailor player training based on the data it collects, and it can even suggest what plays to rehearse or who to start in a game. So this was developed by students as part of their senior engineering design course uh, that started in August 2017, and right now it's only optimized for volleyball. Uh, But they do plan on expanding the software to eventually include other sports like tennis and baseball. I mean, what I what I think is interesting here is that it's cool because uh, this is the type of analytics on the sideline that we've always been uh, talking about and wondering about, like not whether or not these things are going to be able to take over a team, but it would be kind of like an assistant coach type thing where you look at it and it's like, oh, look, this player is having a bad game or right. like is or is like doing something bad in that area that's like this other player is just beating them every single time. True. So maybe try something different. So it's cool to see that this this is a quicker turnaround time. Which is nice, um, though it, it also I still always am wondered by like the uh, roadblock that that's going to have to be overcome with like a lack of data, mm. um, because I don't think we're going to get that though. We're being flooded by data as it is. No, I know, but not in like sports data, sure, but like it's just like if players leave and teams teams change, like you can't like let's say like you completely overhaul a roster, mm-hmm. like you're not going to be able to use the same data as last time as different players. <laughs> no, but again, but you gain so much data from every single game that I don't think that's really a problem though. You know, like our, our problem is not having too little data. <laughs> I guess we'll see. And even with new players, you're going to pick up on their tendencies within a game or two. 
I guess. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. I'm still not convinced on that, but I mean, I'm sure I'll be proven <laughs> wrong. Well, we'll discuss this later. And I also wanted to shout out that Rice University is in Houston. I forgot to mention that earlier. Ah, okay. <laughs> All right. Anyways, yeah, that's it for our news today. Now we're going to move on to new apps and wearables. All right. So to start, Fitbit has announced that it is teaming up with Google to get more deeply involved with the healthcare sector. So it's another healthcare story. Uh, Fitbit will now be using Google's recently announced health data standards for its apps called Google Healthcare API. This will allow Fitbit wearable devices to connect to the electronic medical record systems used by doctors and hospitals. Seems like Fitbit's ultimate goal is to be able to give doctors health data straight from a Fitbit that a patient may be wearing. So we always talk about the direction of wearables uh, and where they're heading. And so this does seem to be more on the health side rather than just the fitness side. Uh, so it's just kind of another good example of how health healthcare is going to really be a big factor when it comes to wearables and why people use them. Absolutely. I mean, this is where wearables are really going to pick up steam, I think, and become more important in people's lives. And it's also cool Fitbit is using Google's cloud platform as well, mm-hmm. which just opened up shop in Canada uh, last year. So that's very exciting for Canadian users, I guess, right? Because um, we have really strict data sovereignty laws. <laughs> yeah. No. So, so it, we, Canadians will actually be able to use this. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's also that that kind of thing where, um, it, like, right now, it's like if you were gonna if you were gonna go sh- to ask someone, hey, are, would you ever buy a Fitbit? Mm-hmm. They'd be like, well, if they don't like go to the gym often or work out often, they'd be like, probably not. But this could be a way in which you're like, oh, yeah, because I need to track my blood pressure or something like that. Right. Your health reasons. And so I think that'll be what's a, that'll be a interesting trend to keep up with. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is a great partnership. Good first step anyways. Mm-hmm. So just the, uh, the second story is just a quick hit. But uh, Apple has re- released its most recent quarterly report showing off that its fastest growing segment with its was its other products category, which includes the Apple Watch. So the category's revenue was up 38% to $3.95 billion and makes up about 6.5% of total sales. This is just another good sign of the success of Apple Watch, but this category does also include AirPods, Apple TV sets, the new HomePod, iPod Touch, etc. Uh, so regardless, Apple calls most of these products wearables, which is just another good example of growth in this sector. Well, it's amazing that as soon as Apple added like wireless connectivity to its Apple Watch 3, that all of these things really just shot up. It's really a sign, I think, of where the wearables market needs to go, right? Like you can no longer have just a device that connects to your phone via Bluetooth. You need to have these other features, I think. Yeah, well, I I think that that was the big thing with the Series 3 watch Mm -hmm. is that you didn't need, if you were going to go on a run, you didn't need your phone with you. Yeah, which is amazing. Yeah, so then for a last story, uh, we have a new health and fitness app idea that comes from researchers at the University of Washington and Seattle University that would essentially crowdsource workouts. So instead of going to a gym and paying for a personal trainer, you can go on this app and someone else would create a plan for you. Now, that plan isn't a, isn't developed by a, prof- a professional, but similar to an app like Uber, you can provide feedback for the person who made the plan and use highly reviewed planners. So currently it's called uh, CrowdFit, but that's just the researching name for it. And mostly it's just in researching phases as of now. They're still doing tests to see how effective and stuff that it is. Uh, But those planners are being paid $7 per plan. Um, So you may be wondering how effective this is, but the feedback that CrowdFit plans uh, received was that they can be nearly as effective. Obviously, it wouldn't be as extensive as an actual professional trainer, though. But it's still, you know, you could still get actual feedback and... Uh, you know, actual advice from people who are, you know, just health nuts who, you know, are just giving out giving advice. I don't know how I feel about this because I mean, like, you're not going to go take medical advice from your like mom, <laughs> you know, like you would trust a doctor or, or someone in the healthcare industry more than them. I, I don't know. Trying to trying to think of a plan like a like a like a fitness plan that someone random has created for you that that seems to me a little problematic. Well, so it w- no one knows what they're doing. But so, but it would be like kind of like you would input your schedule and what you're looking for and stuff like that. But uh, like the way I kind of look at it more, it's like like if you have a friend who's a big fitness nut and you were like, hey, can I start going to the gym with you and like giving like you giving me advice and stuff like that. And it's like that person who is like, oh, this is what works for me. Maybe it'll work for you type stuff. Yeah, I don't know. But like everyone is different yeah. and, and people have their own different biases or even misinformation. You know, like think about the, the whole immunization kind of scare that's going on. Some people think that um, getting shots causes like something like autism. Which is wrong. Which is very wrong. <laughs> you know, there is science to prove it. But these people absolutely believe it for whatever mm-hmm. reason from one report 
that uh, misidentified facts like five years ago. So I, I don't know. I, I mean, I know that this is an extreme well, so example. It, it, I don't. Of this yeah, <laughs> I also don't think though it's mostly like it's not going to be like oh you should eat this and you should eat that and type like that. It's like oh hey do like here's you know a thirty minute workout do thirty push ups blah 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 do that type thing. Yeah, like I guess this might be good for beginners who really have no idea where to start. And so someone who's been going to the gym for a year or two might be like okay well why don't you start with the twenty minutes uh, fix or something that's always in like the good life floor you yeah, know exactly. like, start with that before you move to free weights or something. like that's it that's more i think what i was looking at it when i yeah, look when maybe. i when i think about it i'm like okay well if i were to go uh go back to the gym um I and <laughs> and like you know go up to one of my friends who you know or you know who's a gym nut who's been going to the gym you know regularly for the last five six years mm-hmm. and i'd be like yo what should i do i think it's more similar to that rather yeah, than that's fair rather than like them like people being like oh these are real professionals mm-hmm. because they're being quite candid about the fact that it's not real professionals right like it's more of an informal yeah. beginning to, yeah. to working out that's fair that's fine yeah. but i think once you get past that then i have some issues with it but yeah <laughs> but I, I it also if they don't go past that then then i guess yeah. no harm done yeah i don't know whatever <laughs> Yeah. All right. Well, that was it for our new apps or wearables section. Uh, now we are going to move on to our concussion update where we have a couple stories. So every day, a large portion of athletes with a history of repetitive head trauma are battling with a progressive neurodegenerative brain disease called CTE. Symptoms of CTE include blurred vision, dementia, depression, headaches, memory loss, and mood swings. There's no cure and it only gets worse with time. This is the number one issue in sports. So every week we'll be updating you on what is happening in the world of concussion prevention. So there's not one singular big story just this week, but uh, I have just another example about how Canadian provinces are really taking a leap forward with concussion research. So the CBC reported last week that the provincial government of PEI, or Prince Edward Island, will provide the University of uh, Prince Edward Island with uh, $210,000 over the next three years years to develop a new concussion awareness program that will educate islanders on the risk and implications of head injuries. So the province estimates that it sees about 1,500 concussions a year. So this program is focused on increasing awareness of concussions throughout the, pro- uh, the province, injury prevention, re- reliable and accurate concussion detection, and then also injury management and surveillance. So UPEI also wants to welcome communities to collaborate so that it can become a province-wide initiative with the ultimate goal to make PEI a leader in concussion research. So this will all include coach training, rehab management, and a pilot project uh, project that will start in June with 7th graders. So why 7th grade? It was identified as an age where head injuries can have an even more severe impact because their brains are still developing. So we still don't know exactly the minute details of what this research and stuff will entail, but similar like how about a month ago we reported Ontario has a new concussion law and they mm-hmm. were the first province to do that. Uh, PEI is now doing really just cool work with what's going on uh, and and just bring more awareness because that's a huge factor yeah like kudos to them like the prince edward island is also only it has a population of like 100 200 thousand people i think at the most so i mean like congratulations to them for like taking this step because i mean some of the other bigger provinces have not even made moves to go this direction so good for them good for putting funding towards this and again like we kind of use this segment as a psa for some of our listeners i think prince edward island is also using this as a psa for uh its citizens so good on them yeah and it's like we talk so much about how with concussion it really is going to have to start with schools taking a big part mm-hmm. of it because we and we talked about it last week we talked about it the week before you know it's just uh, by raising awareness within the community as a whole not just sports right uh, that's where it starts because if your parents who have never even who don't watch sports who have never played sports or whatever don't aren't aware of what concussions are mm-hmm. then chances are a seventh grader isn't either Right. I think the point of this, yeah, is to go because concussion right now is kind of seem it kind of sounds like a, a sports problem. But we want it to go beyond that because it's not just a sports problem. It is definitely an everyday person kind of problem. At the end of the day, concussions are a health issue. Yeah. You know, it's like any other, you know, injury or uh, I guess actually just injury. It's not a disease or anything. So <laughs> <No>. <laughs> it's just an, it is an injury. So um, <laughs> uh, so it's just like as like any other thing, we just need more awareness of it so that we can prevent it and learn how to detect it more. Agreed. 
Yeah, and then just a final thing really quick. We wanted to give a shout-out to Daniel Carcillo, a former NHL enforcer who you may remember as the guy who terrorized your favorite team on the ice. Uh, he has pledged his brain to Ted Carrick and the Carrick Institute for study and further understanding of the consequences for a traumatic brain injury. You don't see many NHL players talking about this out loud, and it's awesome to see guys like Carcillo try and bring awareness by talking, just just even just simply talking about the subject. Yeah, like I really hate the guy, and I hated the guy when he was playing because the Leafs played him so many times and he destroyed so many Leafs players. Um, and I think he was suspended or um, fined like 12 times in nine seasons his longest one for like six or seven games so like he's wasn't exactly a great hockey player but I mean the fact that he is now retired and is speaking out about this and has pledged his brain good on him well and it's you know it's a trend we saw in hockey where it's a surprising amount of the people speaking out are enforcers Absolutely. because they were on the front lines of receiving and dishing it out <laughs> so right. uh they you know they they see their friends it's not like you know uh the, see bad stuff happening and so it's cool to see uh guys like Garcilla really speak out and just try and bring more awareness to it mm-hmm. and i really think those are the guys you need to speak out about it too right like the superstars are obviously very concerned about concussions right not that they ever talk about it no not that they ever talk about it but like a concussion almost ruins Sidney crosby's career right <laughs> yeah, you think he'd you think he'd talk a little more about it, but hey yeah but yeah so enforcers those are the guys you need to speak up about this yeah, because if you want they're me the to ones criti- that get it yeah if you want me to criticize uh Sidney crosby's uh uh, lack of speaking out on subjects, then we can sit They're and, all uh, wallflowers. A we whole, talked about we that. We can spend a whole hour doing that. <laughs> uh, but just in a, and also a last uh, a last piece of news. Uh, a former NHLer Jeff Parker, who played for him 1986 to 91, uh, and he passed away last year. He has been officially diagnosed with CTE. This was discovered in an autopsy of the brain following his death, and is yet another link between hockey head hits and CTE. Parker is now the seventh former NHLer to be legitimately diagnosed um but hey uh according to gary bettman there is no link between hockey and uh concussions so um what what do this what do the stats and the doctors know i guess <laughs> yeah i mean according to bettman head hits aren't actually that bad and shouldn't be taken out of the game so well, you know really yeah. really good leader here right. i'm sorry we're a little bitter we yeah. rant about this i feel like every episode sure <laughs> <laughs> so we will end this now yeah. concussions are bad pay attention yes exactly <laughs> that was the end of our concussion update now we are going to move on to our discussion of the week so today's discussion is pretty timely um, the second second round of the NHL postseason is officially underway, and it wouldn't be the playoffs without some controversy, of course. So no one knows what goaltender interference is anymore, and it seems like no one really knows what a goal is anymore either. On April 29th, the Pittsburgh Peng- Penguins thought they scored a goal on Washington Capitals goalie Braden Holtby. Uh, the Caps were up 3-1 halfway through the third period, but of course they're known for blowing leads, and this could have been Pittsburgh's chance to cut down that lead. Um, and so there was a scrum in front of the net, and um, the puck was shot in, or they thought it was shot in, but the on-ice officials couldn't actually see the puck, so they called a no goal. So this was, of course, taken upstairs for off-ice officials to review the Hockey Operations Department in Toronto, uh, but they couldn't find any good camera angles to see if the puck actually crossed the line, so they also decided that it was a no-goal. But, of course, really grainy pictures surfaced afterwards that show in the middle of all that fray in front of the net, the puck did actually cross the line. It's really a terrible picture, but it's clear that the puck does go over the line completely, making all the officials, both on and off the ice, wrong. So the Hockey Operations Department needs to have clear video of whether the puck crosses the line to overrule the on-ice officials. And NHL Senior Vice President of Hockey Operations, Mike Murphy, said after the game that this is an instant, uh, this instant, sorry, was an example of the eight or ten times a year when a puck probably crosses the line, but no video can be found to prove it. So this, of course, led to us and many other people to question why the NHL doesn't have goal line technology because soccer leagues around the world use it and it's a fairly simple technology. You just need sensors and a ball or puck or whatever you're using uh, and sensors embedded along the goal line. And I mean, there you go. You'll be able to see if the puck or ball in or in the case of soccer crosses the line. So our question today is really whether it's time for the NHL to adopt goal line technology. Um, And I mean, I'll start off really quickly. I mean, to me, this is a no brainer. Soccer federations like FIFA and the Premier League are notoriously slow to adopt technology. Like they've just approved video replay for the World Cup after years and years of maybe kind of thinking about it. So, I mean, if they can do it, I feel like the NHL can do it. And I really don't understand how the NHL hasn't figured out how to put a sensor in a puck yet. And during my research for this, actually, I discovered that the NHL does use Hawkeye technology, uh, which is the same technology that's used 
used in professional tennis to see if a ball was hit within the lines of the court, uh, but they really don't seem to be using it effectively. Yeah, I mean, I literally can't think of a reason why the NHL wouldn't. Like I was try- like I know like sometimes we try and make these you know debates and try and take the other side, but there's literally literally just no side <laughs> that makes sense other than yeah. <laughs> I know it's like- not it's not like it's like oh okay well it, it's not gonna like increase times or anything because I am going so I, t- I I did some quick searching about what FIFA's doing mm-hmm. um, because for some reason they've a- they have actually been pretty upfront about it and I mean like they're actually ahead of the NHL on something for once so um, <laughs> which I mean they're both like notoriously like some of the worst at adopting technology so um, this is literally from the FIFA website that I found in a 10 second Google search <laughs> so this is how they uh, describe the they describe goal line technology. So it reads, the International Football Associate Board requires that goal line technology does not interfere with the game, and as such, only the match officials receive a signal on their watches to indicate whether the hole of the ball has crossed the goal line. This information is transmitted within one second, which ensures an immediate response from the referee, and that there are no stoppages or other forms of interference in the game. Unless the competition organization decides to show a replay, this information is only available to the match officials. So the tech they use uh, can come in two forms. So first is camera based. There are several approved systems that det- the, that detect the ball and use software to evaluate the footage from all the cameras. Currently, licensed stadiums work with seven cameras per goal installed as high up as possible within the stadium structure. Now, I can immediately be like, oh, okay, well, I can see the argument of, well, with hockey, it's a smaller net. You know, it might be harder. More people are piling onto it. You don't necessarily see that happen in soccer. Still, okay, here's the other technology. <laughs> Then there's magnetic fields, where systems operate with magnetic fields, where pl- cables are placed underground and around the goal, and the ball has elements of the technology inside. This allows this tech to calculate the exact position of the ball and determine when a goal was scored. So between those two, it should be fairly simple to, if the if the puck just crosses it, if the sensor goes over, it's a goal. Right. <laughs> like, it's not that, like, difficult. You can put sensors on the edge of the puck so you know if it's fully crossed or not. Right. And this, t- like, it's not like this is, like, oh, borderline unbreakable, like, breakable technology, and you still have, like, the video replay that you can look at as well. Mm-hmm. But, like, if you, if the ref get a, gets a notification immediately that this is, that it went over the goal line, then they're like, this was a goal. Mm-hmm. Maybe they challenge it and they try and look at the camera angle, but then the refs can just be like, also our sensors say it went over. <laughs> right. Like, that's the thing. Like, this is so easy. Like, it's not even, like, high tech in any way. It's literally just using a couple sensors, sensors that w- are so small nowadays, you wouldn't even notice it on the puck. It wouldn't add any sort of weight to the puck. Like, people don't have to worry about that, changing somehow how the puck might go down the ice. I don't know. Like, there's literally, like, none of that involved. And, like, like you said, like, I was trying to think of some sort of devil's advocate <laughs> side that I could take on this. And I really, I, I couldn't think of anything. Like for the people that don't like analytics, don't like technology in hockey, um, or because, you know, they think video replays are taking too long or they cause too many delays in the game like this. The goal line technology would actually reduce that. You wouldn't have to go upstairs to the hockey operations department in Toronto every time there's a scuffle around the net to see if a puck had crossed the line under all of those bodies, you know? Like literally, these sensors would tell you within, like FIFA said, within like a second or two. It would cut down on so many delays that I, I don't see how anyone could possibly be against this. And I mean, maybe the NHL is talking behind the scenes about including this. We don't know. They are, just like FIFA, very notoriously slow to adopt new technologies. So we can really only hope that that they offer, that they incorporate this. Like, I'm just, I mean, like, I'm sure it is, like, sooner rather than later going to come. Like, it's just one of those types of technologies that you, like, it's not, like, unless you're just totally anti-technology, then uh, you have no reason to not want this. Mm -hmm. And if you are that anti-technology, then you should be like, why aren't they playing without helmets and with wooden sticks? Because there's there's literally (laughs) technology completely in in all of these sports now. Mm -hmm. So like to like to hurt a league and to hurt a game and like like people talk about momentum of the game but it's like would you rather just like like this is just another tool we always talk about how this doesn't just replace the decision it's just another tool in the arsenal to allow the human to make a better decision right this is one of them yeah and you, you talk about momentum in the game if pittsburgh had actually been awarded that goal they only would have been down one with like 12 minutes left or something in that third period maybe they would have went on gone on to win the game they're down in the series um, well i think it's tied to two is it now yeah i think they won last night well i mean they could have won and then they could have been up you know Mm -hmm. like like we talk about momentum all the time and this very well could have changed the game
For sure. If they had called it right. All right. Well, that's it for today's discussion. Thanks to everyone who listened to this entire episode. Just a reminder that we're also now in a daily format if you'd rather listen to us that way. Uh, This is episode 42, which is very exciting. You can follow us on Twitter at ITV Tech and Sports or on our personal accounts at Mandy V. Kovacs and Alex T. Radu. So once again, thanks to everyone who listened. We appreciate it. (laughs) 